Um, I'm very grateful uh, to Engineers Ireland uh, for having uh, invited me to make a presentation at this city, which is such a great engineering tradition. It's a tribute to the, uh, to the president, uh, PJ Rudden, that the theme of the conference uh, is about entrepreneurship and innovation uh, driving towards a sustainable future. Uh, so I want to congratulate PJ on that account. And I strongly approve this orientation and have based my career on the belief that the world is on a once-off transition to sustainability and that we as engineers can play a seminal role in leading in that direction. So today I'm not going to put up any slides. I, I want to try and tell you a story, um, three stories in fact. First story is about um, mainstream. Uh, you've heard about it and I just want to, uh, well, correct, set the record straight. Uh, then I want to talk about the value of wind. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about the cost of wind power um, and indeed solar. And thirdly, I want to talk about the Energy Bridge project, which is designed to take 5,000 megawatts from Ireland uh, into the Midlands of the UK. So first of all, to start off with mainstream, instead of becoming the world's uh, worst, best golfer, best worst golfer, uh, we took a lot of the money that we made out of selling the company to uh, Scottish and Southern Energy and um, put it right back into mainstream. Um, and the, uh, the name tells the message. Uh, we aim to make uh, renewables mainstream. Uh, we aim to contribute, along with everybody else, to making uh, wind and solar and every other renewable into the only way that electricity will be made by 2050. Um, we have grown from an idea uh, in 2008 uh, to, uh, well, either the largest or the second largest independent um, renewable company in the world now. Uh, we have um, activities going in Chile, in South Africa, uh, in Ontario and Alberta in Canada, in Illinois, California and Ohio. Uh, we're the largest player offshore in the North Sea uh, and uh, we, uh, we have started recently in Ireland and we're building two projects currently, two small projects. Um, there'll be no transition uh, without transmission. Uh, so we're, we're, we're delighted to listen to the last presentation from Dermot and, and to see the whole change that's happened uh, in Ireland and throughout Europe in the grid companies as we move towards the European supergrid, which is absolutely necessary for the deployment uh, of renewable energy. Uh, we've raised something in the order of a quarter of a billion in funds uh, to support the development uh, of mainstream. And we recently won a competition uh, in South Africa for... Uh, 140 megawatts of wind in Jeffreys Bay and two 50 megawatt projects uh, at uh, De Aar and Drugfontein. Um, so we've, we've moved and repositioned the company into solar. And when you see what's happening in solar with the price collapsing by 100% um, in two years to up to, let, let's say, two years ago, and a further 50% in the last two years, uh, and, and where is the limit here? And I'm not so sure that there is any limit. It's not like wind. Wind is not amenable uh, to great spend on R&D to take the cost down. It is, after all, a lump of agricultural machinery that has to be put up into a very wide area uh, to get excited and to take the power out of that. Solar, is not, that's not the case with solar. It's amenable to uh, huge quantities of R&D which are being spent on it currently. One of the great things that we've done in mainstream has been our relationship with the Chinese. Uh, we have profound relationships with six big Chinese companies now including the second largest grid company in the world, South China Grid, um, and including the largest bank in the world. Um, we're building merchant plant in Chile with the backing of uh, the Chinese Development Bank. And we're deploying Chinese technology, which, contrary to what you might hear and what you might see written, uh, is actually as good as there is in the world. Um, Goldwyn, for instance, their director of R&D is German. Uh, they bought Vensus in Germany and they're offering uh, uh, a, a, piece, a piece of technology now which has uh, no gearbox is what they call direct drive and is every bit as advanced as Siemens in this regard and Siemens and Enercon would be the world's state of the art uh, with these technologies. So yeah, we do see ch uh, China, we're quite aware that China is going to pass America out as the largest economy by 2027 and we intend to be their partner and we intend actually to float mainstream in China probably at the end of next year or uh, the start of the year after that. 
Now, in this transition to sustainability, um, and we're going to be 100% uh, no carbon, there'll be no carbon used in the making of electricity by 2050. Now, what does that mean for us in Europe? And what's the opportunity for us in Ireland, as we're all businessmen and engineers here? So what, what does all this mean? Well, we're going to have about 50% uh, of electricity in Europe made from wind, about 30% made from solar. We will have 10% made from, the, from what Paul talked about, uh, from these new technologies. They're not there yet, but they will be there. I'm absolutely certain about that. Um, we don't have too many choices in the world and we have to use all the renewable uh, resources that are to hand. So what that, what that means actually for wind in Europe, if you're going to make 50% of your electricity from it, means you're going to have something like between 1 and 1.6 million megawatts of wind power installed. And because you're limited on land, uh, most of that's going to be installed offshore, um, and that's why you need the supergrid. Um, so in this transition, it's very important that everybody is confident that we are not costing the customer a fortune. And in that regard, I was very delighted to see Airgrid report that the deployment of wind in the Irish system uh, had reduced the, the cost to the customer by 70 million. Uh, in, in Illinois, the Illinois Power Authority recently published a report, which I was delighted to read, which said that having wind on the system reduced the price from 30, $36 per megawatt hour to 35. Now that's, that's pretty good, right? But you know that they are paying the owners of the wind farm $70 per megawatt hour for every, uh, for every megawatt hour they put in the system. So how can that be? Um, all the people who talk negativities about wind take that figure of 70 and they forget conveniently that that actually caused the reduction in price. I'm going to tell you why uh, that comes about. Um, and, and it's got to do with six different factors. The first factor is the merit order effect. Uh, wind is free. Um, as is solar, and, and, when, uh, and they're fixed in cost, so that when the wind blows, you don't dispatch the most expensive unit of electricity. So that's the merit order effect, well studied in Germany and here and, and, and in Illinois. Um, the second one is you don't pay any carbon fines uh, when you make electricity uh, with wind power. Carbon is very cheap in Europe at the moment, 750, uh, whatever. Uh, it's far too cheap. It should be three times that and will be under the successor to Kyoto, but that's, that's another benefit uh, of wind power. One of the most difficult to explain and understand uh, effects of wind on the system is that it changes the systemic risk. Risks on an electricity system are heavily dependent on the, the variability in the price of fossil fuels. Well, in addition to being free, wind is fixed. Uh, so we, when you put wind on the system, you actually change the the expectation and the, uh, the, the fact of risk on that system. And we did a little study in Scotland with Shimon our book, and we showed that if you take wind on the system from 21% to 32%, you reduce the price to the customer by 6%. Almost no matter what you pay uh, for that wind, you change the systemic risk. Um, there's another uh, factor that mightn't be well known as well to, to engineers, and it's incumbent on us, and, and, and I've had to study the science of economics to try and get to grips uh, with this transition to sustainability. Um, and, and one of the things I came across very recently was that in a productivity constrained economy, uh, which we're all in, by the way, uh, compare us with the United States or compare us with uh, us in the UK with, let's say, China, and we, we are constrained in a productivity manner, our productivity is low, lower. Well, when you stop spending on imports, let's say coal, oil and gas, there's a multiplier effect in the, in the economy of four times that. So that means the effect in the economy uh, is if you stop spending a billion on, let's say, gas imports, your actually effect on the economy is four billion. Uh, that's not taken um, into account uh, when, you, uh, you know, in, when you do your ordinary engineering type calculations about the value of wind. Uh, another effect is that when you deploy uh, wind and solar and other uh, renewables extensively, um, you reduce the demand for fossil fuels. So when the demand for fossil fuel goes down, the price goes down. And in another study of Mexico, it showed that if you reduced or introduced 10% uh, renewables into that system, you reduce the demand and consequently the price of fossils uh, by 9%. So it's not for not there. And the sixth um, very large effect that we're coming across in South Africa and in Chile is that you don't need any water uh, to make electricity from wind and solar. Uh, they're waterless uh, sources. 
and in a water-constrained economy, it's quite easy to quantify uh, what that saves the economy. So the last thing I wanted to tell you about was the Ireland um, Energy Bridge project. Um, we, we had a look at what's happening in the UK, and, and we've been very central uh, in the debate on this issue. Uh, Britain is about to close down uh, 15,000 megawatts of coal-fired plant, and that's going to happen and start happening in 2015, and, and in theory should be finished by 2022. Uh, by, um, uh, by 25, all the nuclear plants in Britain uh, will have to be closed down just for engineering and life reasons. Uh, so, so in fact, we're, we're looking at a scenario in Britain where they're going to be chronically short uh, of power if they're going to do that program. Now, of course, they can't do that program if they don't have other sources of, of power for them. So we saw an opportunity uh, to utilize spare capacity in Ireland uh, we have an enormous resource here in Ireland. One, one estimate 10 years ago done by, carried out by ESB showed we had something like 19 times um, the wind power in Ireland uh, to meet our own needs. Um, and there's uh, gates one, two, and three uh, in terms of getting our own house in order in Ireland, supplying ourselves with electricity, is oversubscribed by a large factor, and all we need is some grid, and we'd have 40% of our electricity coming from renewables by 2020. That is not the case in Britain. Britain can't do that. It's got 6,000 megawatts installed uh, at the moment and it has to get to 35,000 megawatts if it's to do that closure program that we talked about. So in fact, uh, we have uh, a, a, most, uh, a most interesting and, and hugely uh, imaginative prospect in front of us here, uh, that Ireland will become a, a net exporter of large quantities of electricity. And this is the precursor uh, for what's going to happen uh, in, in, in Europe in general. You look to Germany and, and uh, the Czech Republic and Hungary and Switzerland and all of these inland places and they have virtually no renewables and no prospect of renewables. So we in these islands are going to finish up supplying Europe uh, with a large part uh, of, their, of their renewable energy. If we're imaginative, if we're bold enough, if we've got the courage of our convictions, if we've got the leadership skills and we, have the, we, we, we do spend that critical amount of money turning this imagination into researched projects. And that's why I'm very excited by what Paul had to say today uh, and, and remain always excited in my life at the idea that we engineers, we, we look at a future that doesn't exist and we create products today to take us to that future. And we see n there's, there isn't a bigger opportunity in business in the history of this planet than we're looking at right now uh, to take us uh, to where we need to be, a decarbonized world uh, of electricity by, uh, by 2050. It would be our plan uh, to develop 5,000 megawatts. Well, sorry, that sounds bad. It would be our plan. Uh, let me rephrase that. It is our plan. We are going to develop 5,000 megawatts in the Midland, uh, and in, well, mainly in the Midlands of Ireland, and to take that directly into the Midlands of the UK. Now, 5,000 megawatts has not been transferred uh, from anywhere to anywhere else uh, in an offshore manner uh, before. So the technology that underpins this doesn't exist right now. And this is part of what I was talking about, the imagineering of the future uh, for us. Uh, we will take the power by direct current uh, to a super node uh, on the uh, east coast of this country. We will ship it in a conduit uh, probably underneath the Irish Sea, uh, in fact, almost definitely underneath the Irish Sea because you, you can't willy-nilly lay all these cables on a seabed and guarantee supply uh, to the United Kingdom. When you move offshore, you have to, one of the big design parameters has to be that you offer the same reliability of electricity supply to the customers uh, that they get currently. So you just can't lay down a cable, and I, I mean, this is not a complaint now about what's going on with the aircraft currently, I'm not making that point at all, but I'm just saying you can't do that if you're going to put the majority of your generation offshore. You have to have really secure ways of getting your power uh, into the customer. So, so it, it, you know, if a submarine comes along and lands on the seabed, uh, you know, you, you can't take that risk. If some big ship comes along with, it, with an anchor that may weigh 20 or 30 tons and starts dragging that anchor along, that'll take any cable out of it. And we've seen the oil cable getting taken out of it. Um, our own Arclaw banks, uh, which we built, I'm delighted to say, without any uh, subsidy from the state uh, in 2003, um, 
we had, within a year, we had that cable, uh, well, a storm happened. The cable disappeared. I, we, nobody knows what happened, but it had to be a ship's anchor coming along, rooting the thing up. Um, although no ship stepped forward and claimed that this was the case. Luckily enough, we had, uh, we had enough cable held in Arklow and we were able to get it repaired within a couple of months. But my point here is that when we face the challenge of supplying this energy source that's out in the sea and in the deserts of North Africa to the 500 million of us here uh, in the middle of Europe, we, we have to imagine you know, how do we guarantee the customer that same level of reliability, that incredible reliability that we've had in electricity uh, you know, starting off uh, 100 years ago. So we intend to develop a super node. Uh, Dermot Byrne in, his one, in the last slide I think he had up showed the meshed grid. Well, when you think about it, that's actually what you need. I mean, you can have all these point-to-point -point connections, but at a certain stage they require a very large amount of reinforcement onshore of the grid. And it's very difficult to get planning permission for grids. We've seen the Bewley Denny line in Scotland uh, take 10 years and it's not built yet. And there's only sheep there to object to it. There's actually no people. And it's only an upgrade anyway. And you still have, it takes 10 years. You can't build grid in Germany to take power from the, the old East Germany into the Ruhr. Uh, North Germany is constrained uh, with wind energy. It's got 20,000 megawatts up there and you can't get it down to Munich. Grids are a big, big problem for us. Uh, my estimation is that we're going to have to uh, go underground with a lot of these grids. We're going to have to develop new technologies to put us underground. And those technologies will be expensive at the start uh, to justify the R&D and to encourage the entrepreneurs to invest. But when you get, like it happened with wind power, but, <coughs> sorry, when there's, I'm exciting, but not that exciting. But uh, success uh, will come and then many players will enter and the price will come down. And that's what we see happening uh, in wind uh, and in solar at the moment. So uh, the most interesting thing of all will be trying to get 5,000 megawatts in one conduit uh, from Ireland uh, to the UK. Uh, and by the way, in this regard, uh, I, I, I don't mind letting you know that we've already booked 5,000 megawatts uh, of the grid, in national grid in the UK. We've, we've paid out our, our money uh, and we've put our money where our mouth is. We, that's why I say this isn't a wood. This is something we are going to do. And we see tremendous excitement uh, for this in Ireland. And we see an absolute necessity for it in the UK. And here's the great thing about taking this power into the UK. They are paying what you know to be two rocks. Uh, a rock is worth about 3.2 pence. And there's a secondary rock associated with that, which is about 1.6 pence. So Britain pays about five pence per rock as, a, as a, an incentive for people to, to build renewable energy. But for offshore wind, they're offering two rocks. Well, here's the good news about taking power in from Ireland. We're going to be able to do it for less than two rocks. We're going to be able to take power in because it's going to be coming largely from onshore, where the development of wind power is half the price of offshore. Uh, we're, going to be, we're going to be able to, um, to take, give them power for less than what they're paying for offshore. And that's, that's a great thing we have in Ireland. We have, we have several things here that we don't often talk about. You know, politicians here in this country sometimes say to me, and isn't it a terrible planning system we have? Well, as a matter of fact, it's not a terrible planning system we have. It's one of the best that I've seen anywhere in the world. You want to try planning in Scotland or in New England, you know, where there's more, uh, more lawyers uh, than blades of grass to object to everything. You want to try building something, building a wind farm in Wales, which we in, in Electricity did for about, tried for about six years. I'm not so sure they ever got built because uh, it got sold to Scotch and Southern. We have a time-bound uh, system here in Ireland, a time-bound planning system, uh, so that you, uh, you actually get your answer from the local authority in, a, in about four months. Uh, and, and if that's appealed, you get your answer from Board Planal in about six months. So in a year, you know whether you have a project or not. And by the way, when you have planning in Ireland, that's really good. You can build your wind farm, providing you have grid and providing you have got good wind speed and all the rest of it and money and, and that stuff. But I, in South Africa, w we got planning on a very large project near Cape Town. And I says, great. And then somebody says, ah, but we can't build yet because the local airport um, has a radar issue. And I said, but don't you look at all that stuff uh, when you're given planning permission? And the answer is no. So this is part of the cultural challenge of being a global company. Uh, but it's one that we have, uh, that, that we've been delighted to participate in. 
So um, let me tell you what I've, what I've said then. What I've talked about is making uh, wind uh, and renewable energy, other forms of renewable energy, particularly solar, making them mainstream. We called our company mainstream because uh, that was our mission uh, to do this. Uh, we talked about the, 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 the enormous growth in this company, uh, how the share price has, has gone up by a factor of six uh, since we started, uh, in the teeth of what was the worst recession since the Depression. And then if we didn't have enough in that, suddenly we got the uh, crisis in Europe with our currencies. So to grow in that scenario meant that you, have to ha you had to have your strategy right. And, and I'm not taking credit for this, I'm just saying this is the way the world is going. So even in the teeth of a recession, for those uh, young engineers and young people thinking about going into engineering, even in the teeth of a recession, we've managed this commercial success um, despite the fact that it's almost impossible uh, to get money. Then we talked about the value of wind. We want to dispel everybody's uh, notion uh, that wind is expensive to the customer. Wind actually reduces the price everywhere it's been introduced to the customer. And then we want to, and we have told you about uh, the energy bridge project which we intend to do. And we don't intend, by the way, to do this exclusively. If somebody came to me and said, you know, I want to build the offshore projects uh, that Dermot showed down along the East Coast, and we'd like to connect into your super node, you know, we would say, yes, fine, that's great, that's what we want, that's what we exist to do. And the only thing we need in all of this, we have great engineering training, we need to let the imagination flow. Uh, in this challenge, uh, challenging time of ours where nothing in the future is going to resemble anything that happened in the past, we have to bet on the imagination and our engineering training. Thank you very much.